So that's that one. Filters is probably worth just talking about. Um, so everyone's familiar when you print something off in the middle, like you see a piece of text that goes through a series of filters. So uh, there's things like censorship filter. Uh, there's naughty words that blacks them out. Blacks them out. So you can't see them. There's filters for multimedia. So if you link to, say, a flash file, it embeds the flash or a movie and embeds it for you. Now, there's some problems with this. Uh, previously, I'm sure people have used them or come across this. The glossary auto-linking filter was really nice. You set up a glossary of all your concepts and definitions for the course, and wherever those concepts appear, you can auto-link the glossary. Wherever those concepts appear anywhere else in the course, it had a link to the definition, which is great, because you can click on a piece of text, get it pop up with the definition. But Sometimes you do a quiz and you want to ask people what the definitions of those words are, and it was a problem because it would link the words to the definition, so it was redundant. Because in the quiz, I just click on it, get the answer. Um, and similar problems throughout the middle course. Now, what you can do with the filters, you can turn them on and off at the context levels. So, I might... by the way, the settings now, you can see there. Um, because it makes sense that in the settings thing, these are the settings for the quiz, so I can actually edit the settings and so on. But one of the things I can do is edit the filters. You can see in that menu, uh, just there, is I can edit filters for this quiz. So I'll go and look at that one. And you'll see there, these are the filters that are on. So at the site level, the administrator might say, I'm going to have these filters off. I'm going to have these filters on, so they're on for the site, like they were before. There's also a third option now. I might have the filter enabled, but it's off by default. So in other words, someone else can use it somewhere else in the site, but by default it's just going to be off. Now, whatever filters are on or enabled, at this level I can go and say, right, in this quiz, when it prints out the text, I don't want my glossary auto linking filter on. It's on now, but I might say for this one quiz, turn the filter off. So, makes it very easy. So now the filters can be turned on off. For this course, I actually might say I don't want any of these filters running. Some courses you may not want them. So, so what an admin could do now is actually enable all the filters and let the teachers decide what filters do you want for your course. You decide. Because you know? um, that was always a problem as well. One teacher wanted these filters running, the other teacher didn't, and you know, they were just on or off. It was the choices. Um, so there you go. Got those options. Was, was, was it what type of quiz questions other than multiple choice, certain lines, any new features coming? No new quiz questions, it's all the same ones. Uh, so if you create a new question, you'll see there. So, yeah, so the standard questions you had before, question types. But the only one they have changed is the calculated questions just put about, that's all. So for those familiar with Moodle, they are the standard question types. They're pluggable, by the way. So there are there actually are some really good third-party uh, question types, like drag and drop, where you drag the name and like images and put them in the right spot. So, uh, there are some good ones. Last thing, just cohorts was the last one I was going to talk about. Um, in Moodle 2, they have uh, these cohorts. Uh, so what they are is site-wide groupings of users. Um, so at, at the site level, site administration users. Cohorts, there we go. So an administrator can actually create cohorts. And what they are is just groups of users, but at the site level. Um, and why you'd want to do that is uh, maybe you have 20,000 users on your Moodle site, um, and you want to enrol, I don't know, <laughs> all the first year students for a course. Uh, it's a nightmare at the moment, because to do that, you either need to uh, handle that by some other system that Moodle runs as a slave off, or you have to go search for each user individually. Uh, now, if the cohorts are set up, um, you can set up a cohort for first year users, and you can enrol the cohort into a course. And Moodle can actually dynamically deal with that as well. So if you add a user later to that cohort, they'll get to that course. So it, it actually partly supersedes the meta course structure. People are familiar with that. It was previously in Moodle. Um, kind of does a similar thing to that, but a bit more. Um, so, simple explanation of it is site-wide groups of users, and you can do some things with it. So, um, yeah, uh, it's just when you get to the enrollment structure, you can enrol a cohort instead of a user. That makes it a bit easier to deal with. And as I said, you can automatically sync those up as well. You can add your users in there. The only one, I, other one, I really want to show, which I can't because of the way I'm running this, is community hubs. 
Um, and this is one of those features, and I can literally say it's been about six years planning to get community hubs running. Um, uh, now, essentially, what a hub is, it's just another Moodle site. So Moodle, the Moodle 2 code ships with everything to make it into a hub site. Um, and all it is is a way to, it's for connecting users together for multiple Moodle sites. So currently in Moodle, we can actually network two sites together, or three sites, or whatever you want to. So you log into one site, and then you can sign on to another, that same login will get into another site, simple sign on and so on. The hubs just takes that a step further of, what the hub site does, it actually lets you publish courses. You would have seen, I don't know if anyone saw it, my course settings. You can actually publish your course. And so if I'd set up my Moodle site to connect to a hub site, it can publish the course to that hub site. And um, what that means is it actually zips it up, sends it up there, and someone else can grab it. So I might just publish some of the content in my course, and let other people from other sites use it. You can also just say, look, this course, I don't want to send it to this site, but I'm going to let other users who are connected to the hub come and enroll into this course. So it's, it's a way to let users connect together. Um, the original idea was to let teachers, so when you set up a course, you might say this is a, a physics course, and someone else on another Moodle site says, oh, I'm doing a physics course, and what it does, it puts you in contact. So it has all that behind the scenes as well. Uh, forming communities of practice, letting you share content, and so on. Um, and so the idea is that you get similar organisations connecting together into hub sites. Um, so already in Australia, I know there's a couple of places already setting up their hubs, um, like health area services in Australia. Um, so it's usually about five or six hospitals under each area health service, uh, and they're all replicating content. It's quite annoying to watch them all. Um, but now they've decided we'll have a hub site and we'll share content through that, so they can all you know, use the same content and get together and talk about things. Why not get the people who are lecturing and teaching get together and... and talk about what they're doing as well, so it's common standards and so on. Um, there's also the idea, that it is quite a complicated structure, there's directory service, servers as well, um, so Moodle.org is going to have, um, it's going to be a directory service, and all that is is tell you about all the different hub sites out there. So ideally when you set up your new Moodle 2 site, you'll connect to the directory service as an administrator, and it'll go, here's a list of 10 different hubs that are currently existing, and you can just grab the links off those and then go and connect to those hubs if you want to. Um, Martin's called it Mooch, uh, the Moodle, Moodle Online something Community Hub. I can't remember what the other I saw. Anyway, <laughs> Martin and his funny acronyms. Um, so that's Community Hubs. And as I said, it's taken a long time because you need to get a lot of code into Moodle. So Moodle 1.8, I think, had to get all the networking in there to network two sites together. Um, the hubs had to be built on top of that. So in several versions, we've been planning community hubs, and finally it's out there. Uh, so what I'll say is there's a lot more to Moodle 2, and I say, oh, it's just looking at new features, not what currently exists in Moodle. And I realise one hour to explain what's happened in the last three, four years is not much. Uh, so I hope that's enough of an overview to let you get excited about Moodle 2. Um, are there any questions about any of those features or any of the other ones? I've skipped over quite a lot as well. <laughs> Currently, I we found that when we use a uh, forum, uh, the student email will be displayed as they post a, a message. Is it still the same feature here? Oh, okay. You mean about letting people post anonymously? Or post uh, well, look, wait, that, look, the teacher can choose an anonymous sort of posting, but if they put, choose to have the uh, display of the name, the user's name, does it display the email account at the same time now? Because uh, students are a bit concerned that they have seen each other's email. Yeah, what it, it actually does what it does in Moodle 1.9, so nothing's changed. Um, it goes back to the user settings. So each user can say, don't display my email address. So as a user, you can actually go to your profile and say, um, don't display my email address. If that's the case, as a user, and I post to a forum, it, it will actually use a no reply address, won't use the proper address. Um, so at the moment, it's, it's a user setting. Yeah. There is a plan, by the way, to make anonymous uh, users in, in courses. Um, just for the very the point, you might have a very sensitive forum where you're talking about issues, I don't know, childhood abuse or something like that, uh, where people might want to post but anonymously, they don't want to put their name to it. Um, so uh, the plan, that's probably going to be in 2.1. That'll come out. So, just the idea that a teacher will say, "Hey, look, this course or this particular activity can be anonymous, and the user can choose." But I'll post anonymously, and there'll be no way to track back to who that user was. Um, sorry, in extending that out, by the way, uh, for schools and things, they also would let you do role playing as well. Um,
because you can say for a course, um, I'm going to take on this name, you can actually choose your anonymous name and I'm going to play devil's advocate or whatever I am for this particular course or this activity. Uh, so you could play role playing type situations with users as well. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Long answer to a very short question. Yeah. <laughs> we're using one for the uh, and we have written some code for uh, creating a batch of uh, courses. Do we need to rewrite those programs or two ones? Yes. <laughs> uh, I would say, pretty sure you would. Um, so much of the core code has changed, um, chances are. Uh, but what's nice from a developer's point of view is there's a web services layer now. Um, so every API function in Moodle should be accessible by a web service now. Again, admins need to enable it, but if you're into that, you can use SOAP, REST's, XML, RPC, all of those are supported naturally by Moodle now. Um, so the idea being you don't need to touch the core code. In fact, <laughs> You could actually write a, a Moodle, you could actually run a Moodle site without ever going to Moodle. You could write your own Flash front end or something, which talks to Moodle. And that also means that you can now use uh, mobile phones. Martin's next project after Moodle 2 is released is to do a proper iPhone app. Um, because it'll just use web services. Um, and you should be able to run it off any platform you want. So for things like creating courses and batches, you should be able to run off your system that deals with that and just call web services to do all the course creation. Which means in the future you don't need to worry about customised code either. So. But, yeah, sorry, no, you probably will have to rewrite it for a little too. Uh, I know that the survey in the previous version no. not customise it. No. How about now? Yeah, uh, so yeah, the survey module, for those who don't know, that was one of those early tools that Martin used for evaluating, because it was a research tool to start with. Uh, and they set surveys. Um, people use either the feedback module or the questionnaire module. They're third-party modules, and they're for creating your own evaluation forms and surveys and so on. Uh, Moodle, I don't know if he's made it. It's definitely going to be in 2.1. There's going to be the feedback module. It's going to be part of the core code, and it will upgrade from the questionnaire or feedback. will upgrade into the, the new feedback module. Martin wanted to rename the survey, but he thought it would be too confusing. <laughs> so I think it's going to be called feedback, but that is your survey tool. Uh, so... There's no harm in starting using that now because it should upgrade without any problems, actually. Um, so feedback or questionnaire, either of those. We have the bulk of all the courses, right? From 1.9 to 2.0, is there a big difference or we still have to manually get the CDS file and upload to the system? You sorry for uploading users? Uh, no, uploading courses. Yeah, so you've got a customised thing of it, haven't you, for uploading, yeah. Um, yeah, that'll depend on your customizations, basically. Um, it will be because of the web services. Ideally, if you've got some other system where you're producing that CSV file, what should you should be able to do now is create a program at that end to call the web services in Moodle to create the courses for you. Yeah, it would speak directly to Moodle rather than having to do a manual process of the CSV file and so on. Um, that's what the web services are for, for all those external systems that talk to Moodle. Yeah, I know if there is any plan to allow file tagging in the repository. Tagging? Yeah. Oh, like metadata and so on? Uh, I, not on the files. Um, There's one of those things where Martin has... This thing is, Moodle is a learning management system. It's not about file management. Um, that's why he wants to deal with the repository systems. So the idea is if you use something like Alfresco or Hive, you can do metadata on your files. Um, so he just says that's for that area. That said though, Moodle, um, you can actually put keywords and tags uh, throughout Moodle now, uh, already, in places. It's actually supported almost everywhere. So you would have seen, even places today, we're showing you, there would have been a little tags screen. Yeah, so now you can tag like a forum post, you put keywords on, on your blogs, on your, yeah. So that, that, that's everywhere throughout the Moodle site now, tags are used, but not for files, because that's in another system, yeah. yeah. Let's be friends. Um, <laughs> if you want to track me down. Uh, yeah. yeah. So that's the good one, Shane at google.com.au. Yeah. Even without the AU should work actually, if it gives me. Okay. Yeah. Good.